Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live session. We are excited to be here with you today. This is our first uh, November live session. <clears throat> I hope everyone had a good Halloween for those of you who celebrate. Uh, today is Dia de los Muertos also, which is uh, fun here in Tucson especially. And uh, we are uh, happy to take your questions. So the way this works is post those uh, questions in the chat window. We'll go through and grab them from there. And um, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the uh, course developers, course instructors, for those of you who have come to us through the course. And um, for uh, if you are not li if you have not uh, subscribed to our channel, make sure you do that because then you can find out about upcoming live sessions. We also have a new uh, Google group list serve. So if you are not getting emails through our courses, sign up for that list serve. I posted the link in the chat. Uh, Chris, why don't you uh, say hello to everyone, and then we'll get started with questions. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to a live Q&A session for the online classes that we run, the MOOCs, um, or, or also if you just found this by some other means. Um, after the fact, they get posted on YouTube, so you can refer to it then. Uh, and I'm ready to take questions on astronomy. Excellent. The first question is from Isla, who asks, um, Hello, Professor. What do you think it could explain early galaxies looking more mature than expected, according to the James Webb Space Telescope uh, observations? So James Webb Space Telescope was designed uh, to look for first light in the universe, which is the earliest epoch of star and galaxy formation. And it's been very successful so far. Uh, it hasn't actually found the very first light in the universe, but it's found galaxies within the first few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And the surprise in those galaxies is that they're larger and more mature uh, in terms of being well-formed and having significant age stars than was expected. And so the challenge to our theory of how structure forms in the universe is how do you form a big galaxy quickly? Now these results do not challenge the Big Bang, they don't challenge cosmology directly. Um, they really relate to how we understand the process of galaxy formation. And that's a complex process involving nonlinear physics. Um, and so it's not extremely well understood, and it's hard to model even in a computer. So I won't say that these results are, again, breaking cosmology or breaking the theories we have of the early universe, but they are very much challenging astronomers to understand better how galaxies form, and especially how you can gather a large amount of material in a dark matter potential well quickly and then form it into stars. Excellent. The next question is from one of our live participants. Uh, Dude, who's on with us live, asks, uh, Hi, Professor. What is your opinion on the detectability of various biosignatures compared with technosignatures or compared to technosignatures with our current or near future technology? So the process of looking for life in the universe does involve looking for the signatures of life uh, in a chemical sense. So these are spectroscopic observations, uh, typically of an exoplanet, hopefully an Earth-like exoplanet or maybe a super-Earth. And the biosignatures would be imprints in the atmosphere uh, from gases that are created by a biological process, by metabolism. Oxygen is the classic example. Uh, on the Earth, the oxygen was put there by life forms microbes several billion years ago. Uh, methane is another biosignature gas. Uh, but these things, these gases can also be produced geologically. So you actually need a whole set of biomarkers and a model of the atmosphere to be confident that you're looking at biology. The technosignature can use the same data because there could be uh, atmospheric gases that relate to industrial activity. And nitrogen oxide is the classic example. During the Industrial Revolution, uh, factories started belching out smoke and pollution and nitrogen oxide, which does not occur naturally in any large concentration on the Earth or in the atmosphere. And so if you saw nitrous oxide in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, it's a pretty good sign that there's some uh, technological, some basic technological civilization producing that. And there are other types of technosignature too, but that's the principle whereby one set of data, spectroscopy of the atmosphere of an exoplanet, could net you either a signature of microbial life or a signature of advanced life. 
Excellent. Uh, the next question is from uh, Lawrence. Oh, sorry, is from Ab H, uh, who asks, uh, "Hi, Professor Chris. How can an expanding universe having a finite age be infinite in size?" Well, that's a good question. So um, the finite age of the universe means we can trace the expansion back to an origin that we call the Big Bang. Um, the fact of the universe being infinite is just allowed by the data. We don't have any evidence that the universe, that, that all of space is infinite. Uh, however, we know that the distance we can see, the limit of our vision, is based on light travel time since the Big Bang, and that doesn't have to be the edge of space. There are definitely were times in the history of the universe when it was expanding faster than light speed. So there are regions of physical space, because of the rapid early expansion, that are beyond our view and may always be beyond our view. And so that leads to the very clear implication of a standard Big Bang model that the physical universe is bigger than the observable universe. How much bigger, by what factor, we simply don't know. And of course, we have to be agnostic to the possibility that space is infinite. Uh, but, of course, we don't have an absolute measurement of that. Uh, the next question is from Lawrence K. Um, does the idea of quantum entanglement provide support for the many worlds theory or the multiverse theory? Um, that's an interesting question. So quantum entanglement is a pretty uh, well-established phenomenon um, whereby you can create a coherent states of subatomic matter uh, where information is shared across a physical distance. And so you have a coherent state where single atoms are not the only entities that matter, but you can have information shared among quantum states across atoms and across some significant physical distance. Now, the quantum entanglement possibility doesn't speak directly to the many worlds idea, which is that the branching points of quantum probability lead to parallel universes, in each of which a slightly different outcome plays out, or to the multiverse idea, which is the fact that the universe had quantum genesis uh, when the universe itself was smaller than an atom, and there could have been other parallel universes. So there's no direct linkage between any of these ideas, between quantum entanglement, uh, many worlds, and the multiverse. They are each intriguing and provocative ideas, but the ma multiverse in many worlds are unproven speculations of cosmology, whereas quantum entanglement is a very reliably demonstrated lab phenomenon. Uh, the next question is from Nader, who asks, uh, Hi, Professor. When the sun becomes a red giant, might it have less gravitational force on the Earth, and the Earth's orbit will change to a more distant orbit? Uh, yes, that's a good supposition based on the late evolution of the sun. So when the sun um, goes into the late stages of its life after it's exhausted its hydrogen fuel source and therefore stops being a main sequence star, it will actually uh, lose some mass. It will shuck off an, an envelope of, of hot, diffuse gas, um, and the, it's hot but cooler than the current photosphere of the sun, and that's why it becomes a red giant. And it's large, so that extends past the Earth's orbit, probably to the orbit of Mars. Uh, and in that sense, yes, the, in the interior gravity to the Earth will be reduced because some part of the Sun's material has moved beyond the Earth. And that doesn't mean, in fact, that the Earth's orbit will change and the Earth will migrate outwards very slowly. Um, the bi biosphere will have been destroyed by this act of the red giant phase, um, so it's kind of moot for life on Earth. But indeed, the orbit of the Earth will change. Uh, the next question is from Hernan Reyes, who asks, in discussion with uh, friends and family, um, some variation of the Fermi paradox always comes up with the inevitable kind of conclusion that someday humans will travel to or visit the stars. Um, but my opinion is that we are not going to colonize Mars or any exoplanet anytime soon. Um, because it's so difficult to get close to the speed of light and because of cosmic radiation. What do you think about our future of space travel and colonization? Is this too pessimistic or accurate? Well, I think uh, there are some rather uh, grandiose statements being made by people like Elon Musk who want to colonize in Mars and and some of the private space companies want to go to the moon and Mars and leave the Earth 
with settlements. Um, I do think it's going to happen. It'll happen very steadily and slowly over the next few decades. Uh, leaving the solar system is an entirely different matter because the energy cost of getting to any significant fraction of the speed of light, where that by that I mean even a few percent, uh, is enormous, prodigious energy costs. And, and so physically large spaceships are not going to be accelerated to a few percent of the speed of light in the foreseeable future with that new technology. However, space program is young, so if you're taking the long view, and especially in terms of the Fermi paradox or Fermi question of where are other civilizations, um, we are looking at baby steps. We've only had a space program for less than a century, and after another few centuries, we could well have superior technology. We can't break the laws of physics when we do this, uh, and so it will probably involve some form of suspended animation to get people out of the solar system at a few percent of the speed of light, and then to do interstellar journeys that may last centuries or millennia. Um, so I think the solar system will eventually be under our grasp or control within maybe a century, and the stars is going to take centuries after that. So these will play out on long time scales. The next question is from uh, Stephen, uh, who is on with us live. Hi, Professor. What would be a good follow-on course after having finished astronomy exploring time and space? I'm particularly interested in learning more about mm -hmm. astrophysics. Right. Um, well, if you want to get more technical, then usually the MOOC route, the Massive Open Online courses, such as with Coursera and our courses, or Udemy, um, they don't, they're not going to necessarily satisfy you because these courses are for adult lifelong learners um, who are smart people and could have professional background and some technical training, but they're not intending to be scientists and they're not didactic in that sense. Um, if you want to learn astrophysics as a follow-on, then you're actually going to need to take a sort of university-based class. Uh, and there are online classes to do that, of course. That's quite possible. Many, many schools have online astrophysics or astronomy classes that involve some math and are more technically based. Uh, so I think you'd have to leave the MOOC sector to get what you're looking for. The next question is from Ragnar Lodbrok, who's on with us live. What is the difference between quasars and Seifert galaxies? So quasars are just extreme forms of Seifert galaxies. Uh, Seifert galaxies were discovered in the 1940s by Carl Seifert, who is a professor at, at UCLA. Um, and they were signifying spiral galaxies that had very bright uh, blue nuclei, lots of star formation near the nucleus, uh, and signs of very rapid uh, gas motions near the nucleus. And those were all indirect pointers to nuclear activity or some form of non-thermal radiation coming from the core. Those were Seifert galaxies and then in the 1960s quasars were discovered which are essentially extreme form of Seifert galaxies. So much higher luminosities, uh, also extremely concentrated, a lot of non-thermal radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and they are so bright, the nuclei, that they outshine their parent galaxy, which is why they're, they're quasi-stellar. That's what the quasar part of quasi-stellar stands for. Um, so these are related phenomena, and that was understood eventually uh, in the 1970s when people started to compare quasars and Seiferts in detail. The next question is from one of our um, online participants, Promode asks, um, hello, Professor. How do you think the world would respond if an alien object was detected on, say, Phobos, uh, the moon of Mars? So finding an alien object within the solar system would be an extraordinary result, of course. It would be the first evidence of intelligent technological life or civilizations out there in space. Um, you know, this is a premise that goes back to the science fiction of Arthur C. Clarke with the monoliths, um, his, his series of books that followed on from 2001, 2060 is the one I'm thinking of. Um, so this idea has been out there in science fiction for a while. Uh, so it would be a dramatic discovery, obviously. Uh, and people are occasionally claiming they found alien artifacts within the solar system. Um, there's, there's no evidence, however, that supports that supposition. Because if you have an alien artifact, you would need to be able to examine it in the lab, uh, take it apart, look at it atom by atom, and, and really be able to deduce without 
any doubt that it was not human technology. Uh, the next question is from an email. Wendy uh, asks, do we know the dimensions of the sun's disk and how it compares with other uh, protoplanetary disks? Or sorry, not protoplanetary disks, but planetary disks. Yeah, I mean, the sun is a fully collapsed, evolved star, so it does not have any residue disk. We have a theory of the star formation process that led to the sun and the planets that supposes that there was originally a very large disk, which, co which actually collapsed on the vertical along the rotation axis into a disk from a nearly a sphere, and then it also collapsed radially to form a much smaller disk than in the first collapse phase. Uh, and the, my, the gas that was in that disk and the dust that was in that disk went into forming the planets and the rest of it was just blown away by the radiation from the early sun, which is much brighter than the current sun. So there's no, ra there's no residue or trace of the early sun's disk. So we're having to infer from a theory of star and planet formation what the size of the disk was. The next question is from R, who is on with us live. Hello, do you think faster than light speed is practically possible? If so, what are the most promising ways? And if not, will it ever be possible if the current limitations are overcome? The, the limitation on faster than light travel stems from the laws of physics as we understand them. So relativity and our current theories of physics essentially prohibit faster than light travel because relativity is posited on the speed of light being an absolute constant and the fastest speed there is. And so what happens when you try to accelerate an, an any object from a subatomic particle to a spaceship faster and faster is that as you reach a relativistic speed, which is any significant fraction of the speed of light, the energy you were putting into the motion of the object to try and make it move faster and the end goes into its mass according to E equals mc squared. So its mass grows according to relativity. And so you never actually get to the speed of light. So it's an asymptotic process where no amount of energy will ever reach the speed of light. Uh, and it's only radiation, electromagnetic radiation, that travels that speed. So unless our theories of physics are wrong, and there's no evidence that that theory is wrong, special relativity, uh, faster than light travel is simply impossible. Pakornin is on with us live and would like to know, is the level of energy um, in the universe the same now as it was at the Big Bang, or is energy somehow created like dark energy and increasing? So the energy content of the universe is constant as far as we can tell. I mean, there's a conservation of energy principle that does apply to the universe, and that's a conservation of mass energy, so you have to take account of the matter as well as the radiation. Um, it is true that dark energy is a constant such that uh, the amount of dark energy in any region of space stays the same as that space expands. So it seems like you're creating more dark energy. Um, but as a fraction of the universe's composition, uh, that means that dark energy is an increasing fraction of the energy composition of the universe. Uh, but you also have to include the energy of the expansion itself. And so when you track all the forms of energy, mass, energy, radiation, and expansion energy, then the conservation of energy still holds. The next question is from David Gold. Could the 17-year life cycle of a cicada be related to some kind of periodic cycle in astronomy, such as the 19-year metonic cycle? So uh, the cicada life cycle is not something I'm an expert on, but I've seen no evidence, certainly in the astronomical literature, that links it to an astronomical cycle. The 19-year metonic cycle is, a, is an eclipse cycle uh, that was known uh, back in Greek and Egyptian times, so it's been known for thousands of years. And it's a, it's a real phenomena, um, and it, uh, 19 years is close to 17 years, but they're not the same. The cicada cycle is also not uh, absolutely rigid, whereas the metonic cycle is a very predictable number. And there's no physical mechanism that would uh, relate the behavior of a, a life form, an insect on the Earth, uh, to the nature of an eclipse cycle, because there's no physical mechanism that could link them. The next question is from Chris, um, who asks, given the date, 
can you provide uh, a little history if uh, or if there is a relationship between Halloween and astronomy? There's an indirect link between Halloween and astronomy or the Day of the Dead. So these two, these two dates are closely related. Uh, and the link is to the pagan calendar. So before there was an astronomy calendar based um, on the sun, a sort of solar calendar that we use now, which really stemmed from the growth of agriculture, uh, most uh, the, the earliest calendars were sort of pagan calendars that related to the sun's solstice and the equinoxes, which is the, the annual cycle where daylight and night time uh, shrink and grow at northern and southern latitudes. And the times when those lights, uh, day, those spans are equal are called the equinoxes, spring and fall. And the longest day and the shortest day are called the summer solstice and the winter solstice. So early cultures celebrated the solstices and the equinoxes. And in the pagan calendar, we're calling this because it's pre-religious before Christianity, um, they also celebrated the midpoints between uh, the solstices and the equinox. So you can imagine uh, eight celebrations. Uh, the equinoxes and solstices are three months apart, and the midpoints are six weeks from them. And so one of those midpoints, uh, the mid point between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice is essentially November 1st. And so November 1st has always been, for thousands of years, a pagan celebrated holiday. And in the modern era, it devolved the trappings of Halloween. And in Hispanic cultures around the world, it also uh, evolved the idea of the Day of the Dead, a celebratory time uh, when ancestors and the dead were celebrated with costumes and music and food and so on. And there's a large part of the Hispanic world that celebrates the Day of the Dead. So Halloween and the Day of the Dead are related, and they're both related to the pagan celebration of a midpoint between the solstice and the equinox. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, Dan Geva, who uh, sent an email. What exactly does the interstellar dust from which stars are formed consist of, and has this dust ever been physically sampled? Uh, yes, there's been some sampling of interstellar dust. So we've had spacecraft that have traveled far enough from the Earth into the solar system that they've captured elements of interstellar dust. Because interstellar dust, it doesn't just exist far in the far spaces between stars, it also travels through space and some of it falls into the solar system. And so we can find this sort of primordial dust and we've measured it. In fact, the Stardust mission was literally trying to use a sort of uh, tennis racket type aerogel to capture interstellar dust particles. Most of the dust particles were not from interstellar origin, but some were. And that's how we know what it's made of. Uh, and what it's made of is a combination of silicates, which is just rocky material, uh, and some of its carbon-rich material, essentially soot. Um, and that's the nature of interstellar dust. And these particles are all small. They're all micron-sized or even smaller. Uh, the next question is from Athulia, who asks, uh, is there any other force other than the gravitational force in the universe? There are four fundamental forces of nature, and they are gravity, the weakest, which dominates large scales, has infinite range. The electromagnetic force, uh, which uh, also has infinite range and is responsible for light and electromagnetic radiation. And then two forces that are on much smaller scales, both within the atom, the strong and the weak nuclear force. And they are, they are by far the strongest forces, and they also have the smallest range. Um, these are the f only four forces that we know of. Every now and then there's speculation that there might be a mysterious fifth force, but no one's found conclusive evidence for it yet. Uh, the next question is from Paolo, who's on with us live. Uh, I would like to know about the possibility of participating in a group of astronomy, excuse me, astronomy studies. I did the astronomy time and space course, um, and I'd like to keep up with my studies. Maybe this <clears throat> would be a good opportunity to explain some of our other courses and any other free courses that people could uh, take. So if you've done our general course on astronomy, exploring time and space on Coursera, uh, we have two other courses on Coursera. 
um, uh, that are different in nature. I mean, they have some overlap, but they are useful follow-ups if you've done a general astronomy course. One is a course on astrobiology that's been running for about five years, uh, the search for life in the universe. And the other, much more recent, just uh, put up on Coursera last year, is the history and philosophy of astronomy. So those are two follow-ups that you could do right on Coursera after you've done exploring time and space. And if you explore the Coursera marketplace, you'll find other astronomy courses that are offered. Some out of the University of Edinburgh I'm familiar with are very good. Um, and so there are, there are probably a dozen or more good astronomy courses that go into a little more detail, maybe on cosmology or astrobiology, than a general survey course of astronomy. Uh, the next question is from um, Abhilasha, who asks, are there any other planets that support life uh, other than Earth? Well, that's the big question, and it's the question astronomers are really hoping to answer in the next few years. Uh, and the answer so far is no. We don't know of any other planets with life, and that's just because we don't have evidence for life on any other planets. It is conceivable that uh, under the surface of Mars there are aquifers and there are life, uh, existing life forms, not, not ancient or fossilized, but current microbial life forms using the energy from the interior and pressure and heat caused by the surface rock and ice uh, to sustain themselves in, other, in an otherwise very cold environment. It's also conceivable that there's microbial life inside Enceladus or on the surface of Titan where it would have a different biochemical nature or in the oceans of Europa. So there are places within the solar system where there could be microbial life. They're very hard to access and we have efforts underway to venture to all three or four locations and learn more, but these are long, difficult, expensive missions. For life beyond Earth, it's the exoplanet study and the search for biomarkers, uh, atmospheric imprints of biology in uh, exo-Earths or exo-super-Earths. Uh, the next question is from Picornin, who's on with us live, who asks, hi, Professor, could something other than gravity affect the motion of time? Um, it is true that in general relativity, um, local gravity affects the nature of time, that, a, that is a clock of any kind will run slower in stronger gravity than in weaker gravity. Uh, for other things that affect time, it is less clear. There's no standard physics mechanism for time to be altered. Um, however, time has a connection to thermodynamics in terms of entropy and disordered states. Uh, so it is possible that in conditions, extreme conditions of heat or high disorder, uh, that time will be less visible. Uh, the next question is from Miles, who sent an email. If somehow we were to transport five billion years into the future, would there be anything left that resembles our night sky? Uh, no. If we went that far forward into the future, um, the night sky would be unrecognizable, and we don't even have to go that far in the future. That, of course, is beyond the death of the sun, um, so we would no longer have the sun in the sky. The sun would have uh, blown off its shell as a red giant and collapsed into a white dwarf. Um, the stars in the night sky are, are almost all within a few hundred to a few thousand light years from the Earth, and that's in the nearby part of the galaxy, which is 100,000 light years across. And those stars are all moving maybe in the disk on roughly circular orbits, but they have three-dimensional motions, vertical motions, and random motions. And so they migrate and move significant distances. So the night sky will change significantly on a time scale of centuries or millennia, and within a million years it will be completely scrambled and unrecognizable, which is to say another set of stars will be visible and not the same ones we're used to. Uh, so you don't have to go as far as billions of years to see the night sky become unrecognizable. The next question is from Frederick, who asks, um, what do you think of the possibility that the Big Bang was some kind of explosion of a singularity at the center of a black hole that has re had reached a kind of saturation point? The Big Bang is in fact, by theory, a singularity, that is, an, it's an infinite cusp of energy and density. 
But the theory does not contain the idea that it's embedded within something like a black hole, something that has, say, an event horizon. Um, so you can make that hypothesis, but there's no evidence to support that hypothesis. And there's no very direct relationship at all between the singularity of the Big Bang and a black hole. <clears throat> the next question is from GeoBlitz. Can you explain the potential implications of quantum entanglement on long distance space communication and exploration, especially in the context of interstellar missions? Quantum entanglement has been demonstrated for a few decades now in the lab, and there have been very innovative experiments that have shown entangled quantum states on substantial distance scales in, to the level of intercontinental, so a few thousand kilometers. Uh, that's very exciting. Uh, but to have quantum entanglement make any relationship to interstellar travel, you'd have to d show or demonstrate entangled states on, on much larger scales than have ever been demonstrated. So we haven't demonstrated uh, entanglement, say, on an Earth-Moon scale or an Earth-Mars scale or an Earth-Sun scale, let alone interstellar scales. Uh, so it's a matter completely of speculation whether entanglement is even possible on the very large scales. Uh, the next question is from... Pardon me, uh, is from uh, Saqib who asks, why does the sun look yellow on the Earth's surface while its real color is closer to white? Um, that's a good question. And, and the Earth uh, provides a filter on the sun's radiation as seen from space. Um, so you can look at the way the sun appears when from astronauts and in Earth orbit above the Earth's atmosphere. And indeed, it does look more white uh, as opposed to the yellow sun that we see from the Earth's surface. And so the simple, atmos simple answer is it's the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the Earth's atmosphere has small particles which preferentially scatter or, or more efficiently scatter blue light than red light. Uh, and so basically the sunlight that comes in towards, to the, towards the Earth or someone standing on the Earth's surface has some fraction of the blue waves or the blue energy uh, scattered out of the sun's beam and across the whole sky, which is why the sky appears blue. And so correspondingly, the sun appears redder than it would otherwise. So you're sort of redistributing the sun's energy. And that effect becomes more dramatic as the sun goes down in the horizon and you look through more of the atmosphere, and that's why sunsets look red. Um, this next question is from uh, Arif Roni, who asks, uh, do topics of computational geometry, like, say, minimum spanning tree uh, or convex hull, um, are there, is there any relation to astron astronomical research using these kinds of uh, computational ideas? Um, those computational ideas are used in, in astronomical calculations and in simulations. I mean, they're standard techniques, uh, essentially, of the mathematical physics applied either to astronomy or to other fields of physics. So yes, these are methods that are sort of computationally applied across different scientific fields. Uh, the next question is from Harry uh, Politopoulos, who asks, the Milky Way is said to have 100, 200, or 400 billion stars. Uh, which of those three estimates is closer to the truth, and why is there such a range? The range is really because of where do you draw the line. Um, if you're talking about the stars that you can really observe and count reliably uh, out to the edge of the Milky Way, then you might get the first number, 100 million, 100 billion, sorry. Um, however, most stars are red dwarf stars, so the number of stars uh, in stellar populations increases towards the low mass end, so there are far more red dwarf stars than there are stars like the Sun. So the larger number, which is actually probably the correct number of about 400 billion comes when you count all those red dwarfs. So most of the 400 billion are actually red dwarf stars. Those stars are extremely faint though, so you don't directly observe them. So the reason these range of numbers is given is because the low end corresponds to the stars you actually can see and detect and measure, and the high end comes from the inference of all the red dwarfs that you can't individually see as a population, but it's the more accurate number for the total population. 
Um, the next question is from Prasanta, who asks, what is dark matter and why is it important in our understanding of the universe? Dark matter is a, a physical entity that we don't fully understand. We know the universe contains uh, something that holds galaxies together and that bends light as it travels through intergalactic space. So this is something that exerts gravity but does not exhibit interactions with radiation. It doesn't uh, emit photons or scatter them or absorb them. Um, and so it doesn't have electromagnetic interactions, just the force of gravity. But we don't know what it is, so we ruled out various things. Uh, and I think the only viable option left is a subatomic particle, fundamental subatomic particle that interacts weakly with radiation or not at all. Why it's important is because the entire chronology of the universe and its future evolution is dictated by dark matter since it outweighs normal matter, the electrons, protons, and neutrons that we and all stars are made of um, by a factor of six or so. So it's really important in describing how the universe as a whole behaves. Excellent. Thank you very much. The next question is from um, Abhilasha, who asks, is it possible to stop black holes from expanding or reducing their force somehow? Well, black holes only expand in the sense that they grow. So as black holes will accrete matter or absorb matter, um, their uh, size of their event horizon grows in a fairly predictable way as the mass increases. Um, and so that's a, that's a natural process for black holes. The countervailing process is the evaporation of black holes, which eventually will lead them to shrink and disappear. But that, ex that operates on incredibly long time scales. So in the real universe that we might measure, we really only expect to see black holes grow over time. And we have indirect evidence of that happening. Um, the next question is for, uh, kind of a follow-up from Hernan Reyes, who um, would like to just follow up about your idea about suspended animation. Uh, since we can only realistically travel a small fraction of the speed of light, um, how do you think that we can, I mean, do you think it's reasonable to think that we could possibly deliver human beings in suspended animation? It seems nice for sci-fi films, but, um, you know, is it even kind of a theoretical possibility? It's certainly a theoretical possibility because we have, there are forms of life on Earth or more primitive forms of life than humans uh, where we've been able to see them go down into a weight state. Um, a tardigrade is a good example. It's a, you know, a significant creature. It's a millimeter in size, but it, it's a more complex creature than you might imagine. Uh, and they go into a weight state where they reduce their water content by a factor of 100 and uh, in a, live in a hardened shell called a ton. And they've been known to survive that state, cryptobiosis, and reanimate after decades and indirectly evidence that they could do so after centuries. So there are simple forms of life that can do this suspended animation trick. For higher creatures like mammals and apes, it's not clear if it's possible. There's just been some very simple experiments on that. The other way that migration beyond the solar system could happen, uh, which is, has some sort of chilling implications for many people, is it might happen through sending not fully fledged humans taken down on ice or in liquid nitrogen, but embryos, frozen embryos. Uh, and then you reanimate the embryos and they grow into people at the far end, at the destination. Um, frozen freezing of embryos is something humans have been doing with great reliability now for decades. Um, and there's no sign that you couldn't extend that time. So there are methods on the books which probably can uh, create suspended animation for small, either for small creatures or human embryos that last centuries and that will get you at a few percent of the speed of light to the nearest stars. The next question is from Crawley Enterprises who asks, is there any connection between gravity and quantum entanglement? Um, not directly because quantum entanglement is a phenomenon of um, microscopic states of matter and the coherent uh, coupling of quantum states of adjacent atoms or atoms separated at a distance. And those forces, the, the quantum forces of nature, uh, operate 
on a very small scale, and they are far stronger as forces of nature than gravity, which has an infinite range and is uh, many, many orders of magnitude weaker. So there's no obvious connection between these two things. Um, Pramod Argade, who's on with us live, has an interesting question. If mass is due to the interaction of matter with the Higgs field, how does it relate to relativistic increase in mass as objects speed up uh, close to the speed of light? Right. So um, the Higgs mechanism um, is, is hypothetically caused by a field that permeates space, and the different mass we measure for, pro uh, for particles just reflect their inertia in traveling through this field. Now, if you add energy to the particles uh, and accelerate them, and, and the Higgs mechanism does not it directly talk about the speed of the particle. It's just an interaction of the field with any particle that creates drag or viscosity, if you like, that, that gives them their mass. If you add additional energy to the particle to change its state of motion, then you're subject to relativity and the relativistic increase in mass as you approach the speed of light. So they're slightly different. They're different physical mechanisms, basically. Um, the next question is, um, um, again, from Hernan, who asks, um, do you have any updates on the launching of a mission to Europa? Um, uh, is that still on schedule? The Europa Clipper, um, which is a, a mission that has had a number of incarnations in the last decade, it was originally going to be a, just a U.S.-only mission, and then there was a European component, and then the Europeans were going to go it alone, and now it's a collaboration again is, I, th I think, still due for launch, um, if not next year, the year after. So Europa Clipper is reasonably well-funded, especially by the European Space Agency, and uh, it's a go project, as far as I know, because ESA's budget has done quite well in the last few years. Uh, it's a 10-year mission, of course, to get to the destination. So even with its current launch date, the idea of getting data would not happen until the end of the next decade. Uh, the next question is from uh, G.A. Wolf, uh, who sent an email, and they're trying to understand dark matter. Um, if it follows the laws of gravity without any peculiarities and the initial conditions were similar to normal matter, um, then shouldn't it be concentrated into very similar patterns as normal matter? Not necessarily. Uh, and the key distinction is that dark matter does not uh, have interactions with the electromagnetic force or photons. Um, and, and that's important. Gravity only is the only force that causes dark matter to clump. So as time goes by in the expanding universe, dark matter will clump or cluster sequentially over time uh, because of just gravity. And so it forms the wells of galaxies and their halos, uh, and it will gradually concentrate over time. Normal matter has extra modes of interaction, and in particular with photons and electromagnetic radiation. And the very particular mechanism that leads to is a way that normal matter, which will coexist with dark matter, uh, can cool very rapidly and therefore collapse uh, as a gas or a set of particles. So it's a hydrodynamic phenomenon, and the cooling occurs through emission in particular spectral transitions. And so this, this is line cooling, as it's called, uh, allows normal matter to collapse dramatically within a halo of dark matter. And so we expect from these physical mechanisms that normal matter should be much more concentrated than dark matter. And that's what we see in galaxies. Um, this next question is from Athulia, who is on with us live. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, educational paths into the field of astronomy. So once you, in in uh, in the United States, you know we have high school. So once you finish something like the equivalent of high school, uh, what classes do people going into astronomy usually take, and what's the path? So people who will go into astronomy have hopefully and presumably taken you know all the science classes available to them at high school. And in the United States, it's, it's, a, it's an uneven landscape of what kind of high school science you're going to get. Some people only may get physics for one of the four years they have in high school. 
uh, and then your ability to take advanced placement exams in physics or in mathematics, which is very useful for doing astronomy, that's also uneven. Depends where you live, uh, as well as in your own skill and inclination. As a student at a university, you would want to take uh, either astronomy as a degree, which exists in a few dozen universities in the United States and a similar number beyond, um, or physics. Uh, physics will involve some astronomy at some point, and typically physics uh, as a general backdrop for astronomy is very effective because astronomers are using physics, it's astrophysics they're applying in the universe, and then you can specialize at graduate school. So you can either learn astronomy as an undergraduate in some locations, which is mixed with physics and math anyway, or you can do pretty much physics, pure physics, with math and maybe the occasional astronomy course and then specialize in graduate school. Um, the next question is from R, and I, I can't, I th we've sort of covered this already, but perhaps we can address specifically um, the idea that uh, quantum entanglement, so they want to know, can we use quantum entanglement for communication purposes over distances like light years and huge kilometers? There seems to be some kind of confusion about this sort of action at a distance, instantaneous communication. But to my understanding, it's more like it can be used for like quantum cryptography. So it's, it's, it's less about instantaneous communication and more about secure communications. So quantum entanglement is, is, is a coherent uh, quantum state across a, some physical distance, meters, tens of meters, hundreds of meters. Um, and that implies that information is transmitted instantaneously. So this is called non-local physics. And it does violate a precept of relativity, special relativity. And uh, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance when the possibility was raised during his lifetime. And now we know that it can happen. We can create at will quantum entangled states. Um, it's not clear that you can use it to communicate. You can't use it to violate causality or to violate relativity directly. Uh, and so it is indeed a way for actually information to be made more secure because you can have uh, information at one location that can only be accessed from a key from another location. Uh, and so that's a, a way of securing information. So it's not a way of violating a relativity. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from Jammy Pants. Um, could it be possible that common iron, which is found everywhere in our solar system and planetary cores and asteroids, etc., is a remnant of core collapse supernovas elsewhere in our neighborhood? Um, certainly the iron we see in the solar system obviously was present in the formation of our solar system. So all those iron atoms in the center of the Earth and the center of uh, any of the large planets with rocky and metallic cores, those atoms are all older than four and a half billion years, and they were produced somewhere. Uh, the uh, iron, that said, the core of an evolved star, where it's the final state of fusion because it's the most stable element, has the lowest binding energy per nucleon, that is essentially trapped in the nucleus of a star unless there is an explosion. So yes, supernovae are responsible for dispersing those iron atoms or ions into interstellar space where they can eventually become full part of forming solar systems and planets and their cores. Uh, the next question is from Ellensburg, Washington. Um, how did former civilizations know so much about the stars and star system despite not having any of, any of the observational tools we have now? Do signs on pyramids and things like Nazca lines tell us anything about uh, what they knew and how they learned it? Ancient civilizations used the stars in very practical ways. They used the stars for timekeeping, for navigation, and then obviously there was a cultural aspect where they would tell stories about the stars and mythology linked to the stars. Um, so their practical knowledge was pretty profound. They also in simple civilizations before the telescope, they could make fairly accurate observations just by using sight lines and repeated observations over a period of time. So their knowledge of positional astronomy was pretty good, as good as it could be before the invention of the telescope, and they were able to work that knowledge into, into practical ways 
of timekeeping and navigation. Um, the next question is from Pakornan, who would like to know, are black holes always perfect spheres? No, black holes will not be perfect spheres because they are all spinning, essentially. So a black hole forms from a gravitational collapse of a, a star, say, um, or even at the center of a galaxy of material that has angular momentum. And since it has angular momentum, they will be oblate spheroids, which is to say they will be larger, the event horizon will be slightly larger at the equator than it is at the poles. Uh, now we can't measure that effect. We don't have accurate enough measurements of black holes and images of black holes to prove that, but that's what the physics says. Um, the next question is from Wise Investments. Do you think if James Webb demonstrates the Big Bang Theory is not how we works, or it doesn't work how, um, how we thought of it, uh, do you think that the scientific community will be able to put egos aside and admit uh, as such? It's an interesting question because the Big Bang has some elements of problems with it, apart from the fact that we don't know what the two central ingredients of the universe, dark matter and dark energy, are. We also have the this very early formation of massive galaxies from James Webb, and then from a set of observations, we have what's called the Hubble tension, the fact that the expansion rate inferred early in the universe from microwave radiation and recently in the universe from observations of nearby galaxies don't agree with each other. Um, is this going to cause the downfall of the entire theory? It's not clear. Uh, are some astronomers overly attached to the theory? Probably. There's a lot of investment in the Big Bang and it's been successful in large part. So there is always resistance in the scientific community to abandoning a cherished and fairly well supported idea. And at what point does the these problems become more than flies in the ointment, but become something that brings the theory down. That's never clear, except in hindsight. So I'd say at the moment we have uh, tremors in the support for the Big Bang and tremors in the solidity with which it explains the universe, but they're not yet at a crisis level. Uh, the next question is from Ravi, uh, who sent an email. A gravitationally lensed image depends on the intervening dark matter distribution and also the positions and shapes of the galaxies and stars being lensed. Since we don't have an unlensed picture of those galaxies or stars, how do we uniquely solve for the dark matter distribution in between? Um, that's a good question. And it, so you are modeling clearly uh, a gravitational lens system, treating it like gravitational optics working back from the image plane, which is what you see in your telescope, to the object plane, which is the objects before they were lensed. And so there you just have to compare, all, in part, with theoretical expectations of what galaxies and objects look like when they're not affected by gravitational lensing. And we know what they look like because we have nearby examples which are not affected by lensing. So if you assume that the galaxies have the same fundamental nature and shapes, uh, in the distant universe as in the nearby universe, then you can make a pretty good guess as to what the objects look like before they were lensed. Uh, the next question is from Wendy. Um, what can we learn from the cosmic neutrino background, and why don't we call it a field as in the Higgs field, uh, where the Higgs boson is the force carrier um, of the Higgs field? Um, the neutrino background, as it's called, is distinct from the Higgs field. The Higgs field is literally a field that permeates space, it, it, even the vacuum of space, that gives rise to the attribute of mass. And that's fundamentally different from particles, which neutrinos are, that are moving at essentially the speed of light through space. So the neutrinos are more Commonly, they're more closely related to an electromagnetic background, uh, something moving at close to the speed of light, than they are to a field. Uh, what neutrinos can tell us is quite important about the early universe because uh, neutrinos were created in the early phases of the universe uh, uh, and they were liberated because they were part of nuclear reactions. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you know, neutron decay leads to an antineutrino emitted and then it travels through the universe and neutrons have been decaying in the universe since the Big Bang. We also have a first phase of nucleosynthesis when the hydrogen 
was converted into helium and other light elements in the first few minutes of the universe. And those set of fusion reactions also lead to neutrinos in the background. And so, in principle, the neutrino background is a probe for early universe physics. It's just not for measured very well or accurately because it's so hard to detect neutrinos uh, that the precision cosmology that we're able to do with the microwave background radiation cannot yet be applied to something like the neutrino background. Um, all right. Uh, it's just about time for us to wrap up for today. So uh, we've got one final question, and that is from an email. Uh, how does Hawking radiation differ from electromagnetic radiation, and could it impact dark energy? Um, Hawking radiation is electromagnetic radiation. It's, it's radiation that is emitted, according to that theory from Stephen Hawking from 45, 50 years ago. Uh, by black holes, so it's, it's due to the creation of uh, particle-antiparticle pairs out of the vacuum where one member of the pair is liberated and the other member of the pair is absorbed into the black hole. And the net effect of this is the loss of a small amount of mass or equivalently radiation from the black hole. So it, so it, is, it is radiation. Um, and the second part of the question was how is it related to what? Uh, the question is how is it um, related to dark energy? Could it impact uh, it somehow? And the, and the Hawking radiation, which is still hypothetical, has not been observed, is not directly related to dark energy. Dark energy is a property of the vacuum of space and so applies anywhere in the universe, uh, whereas Hawking radiation only applies at the event horizon or near the event horizon of a black hole. So a lot of good questions this week, as always, some quite esoteric and high-level ones. And uh, thanks to Matthew for facilitating, and we have our... Uh, our, we scheduled our next few sessions, and I can't remember when they are, but we um, maybe we can tell you now, and then you'll see them on our calendar. Absolutely, yes. Um, we have our next one is next, uh, sorry, in two weeks on Wednesday, November 15th. And if you uh, scroll to the very top of the chat, um, I posted information about how you can subscribe to our Google Calendar um, or how you can subscribe to our Google Group um, so you can hear about upcoming uh, live sessions. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel because everything comes out through there and um, you can see upcoming live sessions and you'll get alerts if you uh, click the bell icon uh, so you receive all alerts. You'll hear um, all about upcoming uh, scheduled live sessions. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, we will uh, be back again in two weeks. So that again is Wednesday, November 15th. Take care, everyone.